at. Thank you. I think, have you gotten the little, it's recording now message? Yay, technology. All right, so I'm Sharon Murchie. Um, and if we could just really quickly um, just jot around the room so that I know um, what level you're teaching at, that always kind of helps so I know kind of who my audience is. So Ginger. So I teach uh, junior and seniors. And I actually team teach with Matt Gebhardt, who is also in this session at a PBL school. Awesome, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Melissa. Hi there, um, I'm from Maryland and I teach ninth, 10th and 11th graders. Awesome, Deanna. Hi, I teach um, ninth and 10th graders. Shailen. I teach mostly juniors and seniors. Okay. Marianne? I teach juniors and seniors also. Awesome. <clears throat> Jan? 10th grade this year. 10th grade. Yeah. Amanda, you're at a makerspace, right? I am at a makerspace, so I work with K-8 kids typically. Okay, awesome. Megan, I know what you teach, but you can tell everyone else. Yeah. Um, I am special education, so I'm kind of everywhere. This year I've got 5th, 7th, and 8th, um, and I'm doing reading and math. Okay. Awesome. Matthew. Hey, good morning. I teach uh, 9, 10, and 11, and 12. Okay. And then Sarah. Good morning. I teach 10, 11, and 12. Awesome. Okay, cool. So a lot of us are um, in the same similar subject matters. Um, for 20 years, I taught 11th and 12th, and then changed jobs this year, and now I am teaching 10th and 12th. Um, so a um, bit of a change, but um, that is okay. All right, I got to pull one thing up here so that I am not going in too many directions. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And this slide deck I can also put in the chat for you, um, which is right here. It's also on the agenda. Um, so, um, it's a slide deck where you can make a copy and then you should be able to access everything on it. All right, whoops. And of course I didn't start on the beginnings. Now you've seen the whole presentation. There we go, now we're done. <laughs> All right, there we go. Whew. So um, I'm gonna talk to you today about the New York Times Learning Network. I am not um, a representative from the New York Times. Um, but I have had the opportunity to um, be part of a program last summer with the New York Times and really got to jump in and I learned so much. The resources are incredible. And so my goal today is to give you a very brief overview of so many things that are there, but then also dive into one specific resource um, and show you like so many different ways one resource can be used so that you don't have to be overwhelmed by so much stuff there, but rather, hey, here's one, one go-to, one, one tool in your pocket. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, this was going to be a little bit of a fun interactive with a poll, but my poll disappeared. So um, we will just do, no, not that. We will just do it with a shout out. Not sure why I'm struggling, here it is. So there's a weekly news quiz um, every week on the Learning Network. And so uh, we were gonna check our quiz or our news understanding from the last two weeks. So I will read the question. Normally I would show a poll and you would just um, anonymously respond in the poll. But actually what I'm gonna ask you to do just for the sake of time is to um, unmute yourself and just kind of shout out the answer that you think is correct. And if we don't get it right, that's okay. Cause I can tell you that there is one that I do not know. Um, so I have no idea on that one, but these are 10 news questions. And this um, weekly news quiz is one of the things at the Learning Network. So question number one, on January 20th, Joseph R. Biden was sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. Which of the following is not true of the inauguration ceremony. 
Which, Every living former president was in attendance. You are absolutely right. Thank you. That is the correct answer. Um, and then it gives you a little bit of uh, information and then a link to an article um, that supports the uh, knowledge of that question. Question number two. In 17 executive orders, memorandums, and proclamations signed hours after his inauguration, President Biden moved swiftly on January 20th to dismantle Trump administration policies his aides said have caused greatest damage to the nation. Which of the following is not one of the many executive orders signed so far? An executive order abolishing the Senate filibuster. You are correct. He did not abolish the Senate filibuster. And again, gives you a little bit of information explaining the um, response and then a couple of articles that you can link out to, to extend student learning. Number three, President Trump used his final hours in office to wipe away convictions and prison sentences for a roster of corrupt politicians and business executives and bestow pardons on allies like Blank, his former chief strategist, and Elliot Brody, one of his top fundraisers in 2016. So which of these people was his former chief strategist who he pardoned? Steve Bannon. You are correct. This is one where um, it's a little bit of a trick because we also know that he pardoned Michael Cohen, but Steve Bannon was the former chief strategist. Number four, the State Department declared on January 19th that the Chinese government is committing genocide and crimes against humanity through its wide-scale repression of blank and other predominantly Muslim ethnic minorities in its northwestern region of Xinjiang. I'm going to say that's Xinjiang with confidence. Which one of these is the predominantly Muslim ethnic minority? Anyone want to be brave? I'm not sure on the pronunciation, but the Uyghurs? Yes, I think it's pronounced Uyghurs. Because every time I hear it, I'm like, what did you say? Oh, Uyghurs. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah, it's this one, the Uyghurs. So again, gives you some information and then links out to articles. Number five, Link, who faced down racism as he eclipsed Babe Ruth as baseball's home run king, hitting 755 homers and holding the most celebrated record in sports for more than 30 years, has died. He was 86. Who was this individual? Hank Aaron. Yes, Hank Aaron is the correct answer. Um, number six, more than 400,000 people in the United States who have had the coronavirus have died as of January 23rd the country has recorded how many coronavirus cases? I know this was one I didn't know either the first time I took the quiz. Anybody wanna take a guess? Five million. Five million, that was what I thought. No, the answer is 25 million. <gasps> I know, I went with five million too. So then I went, okay, I'm gonna go read these articles to learn more about this. <clears throat> Number seven, the College Board, which administers the SAT college entrance examination and has seen its business battered by the coronavirus pandemic, said on January 19th that it will do what? Drop the optional essay section. Yes, drop the optional essay section and English teachers across the nation cheered. Um, juniors will still have to take it this year. They're dropping it, I believe, after the administration in June. So um, in Michigan, this is our mandatory standardized test and they'll still have to do this. But so through June, essay still there. After that, no more. Number eight, the January 20th inauguration got attention for its numerous fashion statements. Among them was Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, who became an internet meme after being photographed donning a bulky coat and... Mittens. Mittens, his mittens. mittens. Yes, if you follow me on Facebook, I have been um, posting so many Bernie memes because they have made this week survivable. Number nine. Um, this one, I was very much an old because I had no idea what the answer was. 
the music industry's first runaway hit single of 2021, Blank, by Olivia Rodrigo, debuted at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 Singles chart, etc. Anybody know what the name of her song is? I think it's Driver's Um, Driver's License. License? Yes, you guys are right. I had no idea. Clearly, I am not listening to the right radio station. Um, And number 10, three of the economic-related articles below were recently published in the New York Times. One is from the satirical site, The Onion. Which of these stories is a fake news story or satire, I would say? The last one. Seven cent yeah, coin? The seven yeah. cent coin, right? I kind of feel a little bit attacked by this one because counting by sevens has always been one of my like panic moments. Right. So I'm like, oh, yeah, you're talking to me, aren't you? Anyway, that is satire, which what a great opportunity to talk to students about the difference between satire and fake news. Um, But also like how to cite how how to discern whether or not something seems like it might be believable. So I wanted to start with that because um, it is just such a weekly easy way to um, engage students with the news and then take them back into um, resources and articles to expand their knowledge. Um, I started doing these weekly quizzes with my um, mentor hour, which is kind of like a homeroom. Um, I only see them once a week and, you know, it's given us a structure. It's given them something to expect. Um, It's given us a talking point. So um, I really appreciate this resource. So just again, I'm Sharon Murchie. Um, I teach at Okemos High School. And that is my school email address and my Twitter account. Um, And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the New York Times Learning Network. So I was able to be a part of the teaching project. The teaching project is um, a project where they invite 60 teachers from around the United States um, in um, all areas of um, curriculum, including librarians, which was awesome to have librarians there, um, to work together. My little picture is here right above the R. Um, And the the teaching project is actually a three days in New York City at the New York Times all expenses paid trip. Collaboration with 60 teachers from across the United States. And it's a year long project. So it's three days in the summer, and then monthly Zoom meetings. Um, In the project, you're invited to create and implement and reflect on a project that uses New York Times resources. And then you are also also supposed to create some sort of deliverable that is published at the New York Times, whether it's to write an article for them, create resources for them, record a webinar. Um, So fantastic um, opportunity. This last year, of course, it was virtual. So my three days in New York pending trip is still pending, but they have promised that once the pandemic is over, they will fly us out there. Um, Unfortunately, the deadline to apply is February 2nd. So if this is the first time you've heard about this and you're like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. You have time to apply, do it tomorrow. Um, You do need two letters of recommendation, but on the slide deck right here is a hyperlink out to the information about it um, and tells you like how to apply, et cetera. So I just wanted to tell you about that Um, because that's my knowledge base, but also if you do not have the chance to apply this year, but it sounds like an incredible opportunity, definitely apply next year. Hold on just one second. Oh, in my purse. In, in my purse. Apologize, got a son that's gotta go to baseball practice. All right, so the project that I wrote for, um, that. The, with the teaching project was, was called Writing Our Own Lives. And it was a personal narrative project where students used mentor texts from um, the lives section of the New York Times and also a student narrative contest, the winners um, as mentor texts. 
then wrote their own personal narratives. And then at the end of the unit, they could su- my, my sophomores could submit their personal narratives to the New York Times contest if they chose. And my seniors um, worked on tailoring their personal narratives for the Common App uh, essay. So that was the project that I created. Um, but these are the resources available at the Times at the Learning Network. Um, there are, let me see, oh yeah, okay, I'm like, wait a minute. So there, there's a lesson of the day, there are writing prompts, there are quizzes, there's multimedia stuff, there's contests, um, a lot of interaction. Um, so, so many different activities that are already built for students. And this year, students get free digital access to the New York Times until September 1st, 2021. Um, So if you do not have your students signed up yet for the free digital access, um, by all means, do it. And again, I will put it into the chat. Hopefully, there you go. So that is the link to get your students signed up. Um, it is pretty easy to get them signed up. You need to sign up with a school email. Um, so make sure it has a school, um, extension so that the New York Times recognizes it as being a school. You need to import your students' school email addresses. So you just copy and paste those, and then it will generate an invitation out to students. Students have to click through the link and set up their account. And once they do that, they get free digital access until September. Um, So it's interesting, Marianne, because I already had an account as well, and I was able to set them up. Um, But I guess it just depends on your district and how it works or how the addresses work. But it does work. So um, there are, at the times, professional resources and webinars for teachers. Um, So lots of different information that you can access. There's a writing curriculum um, that works really for uh, middle school through high school. I think it's six or seven different units complete with mentor texts and suggestions. Now it does not lay out daily lesson plans, but it does have all linked resources and suggestions on how to use these resources um, in a writing curriculum. So it's a fantastic resource. Um, See if I can show it real quick. Seven units, yep. So there are units on, um, there's writing prompts, There's daily opportunities, there's guided practices, there's teaching ideas and webinars, and a contest at the end of each unit. Um, They have a fantastic resource on race, racism, and racial justice. It's a whole section of the Learning Network. These 26 mini films for exploring race, bias, and identity with students, I have used these in my classes for, for several years now. Each film is four to six minutes long um, and are so informative, but the ones especially that are exploring race um, are, you know, interview clips from young people as they talk about um, what it's like in the United States today um, to be of that race or of that ethnic group or of that um, religious group. So it's fascinating and really helps our students see, um, you know, those windows um, into um, the experiences of others. Like I said before, there's contests, a number of different contests, the personal narrative contest that my students have entered. Um, There's a 15 second vocabulary video contest, which is kind of hilarious that students can enter where they record a 15 second vocabulary word video. So, so many resources there with contests. Um, On the slide deck, each one of these links out to um, a a one of the resources that um, I think is just really helpful. Um, So, for example, the word of the day, it gives you a, um, the word, the, um, like, explanation of the word, 
And then it also says like, it has appeared 19, in 19 articles in the past year, including here's an article. So all the different ways that that word showed up in the New York Times, including um, a little mini quiz on if you know what it means. So um, great resources on that. Um, and the resource that we are going to really dig into for the rest of this presentation is what's going on in this picture. So what's going on in this picture is um, a weekly photograph that they put up that has so many different things that you can do with it. So for example, um, this is the what's going on in this picture um, page and can show you so many different pictures. Um, and I will walk you through some of the things that you can do with it. So if you're using what's going on in this picture in the way that the New York Times has designed for it to be used, um, you can have students work through these three guiding questions. What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? what more can you find, right? So students can brainstorm and think about that. And then they can join the conversation online. Um, if they are ages 13 and older, they can post on the what's going on in this picture blog, um, you know, to answer these questions and what they think is happening. And then they can respond and reply to others, other students. So there can be this online discussion as they unpack um, the story of the picture. And from nine to two every Monday, a whole group of um, artists and professionals from across the country, um, from the Visual Thinking Strategies um, nonprofit, facilitates an online discussion with students about the what's going on in this picture. So the students have a chance to interact not only with other students, but with these professionals. And then on Thursday afternoon, the, go back, there we go. On Thursday afternoon, the story of the picture is revealed. So every Thursday afternoon, they actually do a reveal of what's going on in this picture um, and what the actual, um, story was. So for example, what's going on in this picture? Um, I'm going to give you two minutes to take a look at this picture and think about the questions. What is going on? What do you see that makes you say that? What more can you find? And think about that for two minutes. And then in the chat, write a sentence or two about what is happening in this picture. So I'm going to go silent for two minutes while you explore this picture. All right, please type into the chat, what is going on in this picture? What do you see? Um, what makes you think that that's what's happening? What more information can you find? What do you think is happening here? Type it into the chat.
please type your answer into the chat. Megan answered, oh, Melissa, people are dressed like evergreens and are going door to door. A small town in New Hampshire. People disguised as trees. Yeah, good. Things that you see, things that you notice. And so as you do that and think about that, the um, on Thursday of the week that that picture was posted, they then did the reveal. And so this is the reveal of what is going on in this picture. The original caption to the picture read, equipped with branches of pine trees and cowbells, so-called Sylvester Chloisa, New, Year, New Year's clauses, walked from house to house in Waldstaff, Switzerland, probably Waldstaff, Switzerland, to offer their best wishes for the new year to the farmers of the region. After their singing and dancing performance, the Sylvester Kloiza, Klauza received food, hat, drinks, or money, right? So it tells you who told the, took the photograph and, um, and what the story is. Um, and so that is a way for students to, you know, engage in an online space um, and really participate, not only with other students, but with professionals um, at the New York Times on the blog. So another thing that you could do is use the photographs as bell ringers, right? So this photo can just be pro projected in the classroom as students walk in for a five minute riding into the day silent activity. Or if you're like me right now, currently on Zoom, as students enter my Zoom room, I could have my screen shared and they would know that this is the activity that they are working on for the day. So for example, we're not gonna take five minutes for a bell ringer, but we'll take two minutes for a bell ringer. In the chat, respond to this photograph. Maybe it's what you see. Maybe it's the story behind it. Write a sentence or two as a bell ringer. So as you see in the responses, right, so many ways that students could respond as just a quick bell ringer, right? So some people are being, being very practical, probably telling the probably true story about a cow rescue. Um, and, you know, I decided to make up a little story about Fred and Olaf and their pet cow, Millie, who they take out for swims in the ponds on the regular. Um, Ginger told a short story, six word story with the, uh, with the writing into the day. So, so many things that you could do with this as just a quick bell ringer. I was also thinking about in a foreign language classroom, how fantastic would this be as a practicing activity, um, whether you are uh, a first year student and just working with, you know, concrete nouns and adjectives and verbs. Or maybe you are, um, you know, a second or third year foreign language student where writing the story of the picture would be um, a great way to practice your, 
um, your foreign language. Um, or you could write the dialogue between the people in the picture or even have a verbal discussion, you know, to project the picture and have students discuss what is going on. So for example, as I look at this picture, I think about my very basic Spanish and my very mediocre German. Um, you know, what could I say about this picture? Um, so I invite you to do that, right? Think about what foreign language do you have a little bit of exposure to? Maybe it's even just numbers, right? Maybe it's numbers, maybe it's colors, maybe it's complete sentences. In the chat, whichever foreign language you have just a little bit of knowledge of, or maybe a whole lot of knowledge of, I don't think the um, our French teacher is in this group, type into the chat, be brave. What do you see? I see some French, I see some German, I see some Spanish, <laughs> Google Translate. Jan, you're cheating. You are supposed to be pulling from your own knowledge base. Right, maybe it's just numbers, maybe it's just colors. Maybe there's a sentence or two. So just, you know, how to think outside of the box, but what a great way to have um, students working, trying to dig through um, their, you know, filing cabinet of the words they've learned in that foreign language and put it to use. All right, thank you so much for playing along. So another word, another thing that I thought of was what about if we did six word stories and memoirs, right? You've got the famous six word story from Ernest Hemingway for sale, baby shoes never worn. Or my daughter's six word memoir that she wrote when she was 10. Um, she showed it to me. I think I am belonging wrong. I thought, oh my gosh, in six words, she has captured the um, experience of every middle schooler on the planet. Um, or, you know, as I was thinking this morning, I'm like, oh, we are the champions, my friends. What a fantastic story that is from Freddie Mercury. Um, so this link here goes out to um, a HuffPost article, but so many more just amazing six word stories, right? Label, not for you, not for oral use. Oops. Ring, church, groom, where is she? Right, so many just great six word stories that you can write. Um, and so, I'm gonna give you two minutes to think about the six word story that you could write for this photograph.
once you have a six word story, put it into the chat so we can all see. This is awesome. I love reading these. Hopefully you've got the chat window pulled up too. So you can see just woman wonders, who is this kid, <laughs> right? Awesome. Uh, oh, nope, sorry. Click, there we go. So you could also use this um, for creative writing, right? To expand students and make them really tell the story um, that is happening to make up the creative story, right? And to use some of those creative writing um, keys like show, don't tell, and plot structure. Um, and so we do not have time to do a creative writing story, but take a look at this photograph and think about the creative writing story that you could tell. In the chat, write the first word, the first sentence of the story of this picture. The first sentence of the story of this picture. Give you another 30 seconds or so to write the first sentence of this story. Awesome. I love seeing what we come up with on the fly, right? Um, and then one way that I've used what's going on in this picture in my um, sophomore and senior English classes this year is to use them to teach author's craft. Um, I use the term author's craft all the time, whether I'm talking about um, fiction or nonfiction, um, because I want the students to see that no matter what, writers are making purposeful decisions 
in their writing. And that a writer is an artist just with words. And so I've used what's going on in this picture to try to help students um, begin to see all of the thoughtful decisions that an artist makes, or in this case, a photographer makes when they are crafting their piece of art. And so, um, excuse me, the um, language and terminology I use is to like zoom in and then zoom out and then zoom in and then zoom out. So I want us to do that with this picture. So I want you to look, first of all, at the clothing, just at the clothing. What do you notice? Put it in the chat. What do you see? What do you notice? Just simply from their clothing. Yeah, we see coats, we see bell bottoms, we see some stains on knees. Yes, the style of the jacket. There's a Steelers jacket um, and you see like the jackets look like they're from the 70s or 80s, especially the jacket in the front. Now I want you to zoom out and look at the group of boys, right? Look at the group of boys. What do you notice? Oh, I just gave one away. They're all boys. <laughs> what else do you notice? Look at the group of kids. I notice hairstyles, right? I notice hairstyles that are kind of a little bit long, a little bit shaggy. Yeah, the expressions, they seem very curious and very focused. They look to be about the same age. They seem to be working together. They're fairly diverse, right? There's definitely diversity in these students. Now I want you to zoom in again and just look at what they are holding. What do you see and what they are holding? For example, I see paper, but I don't see anything written on the paper. I see boxes, boxes that have clearly been used multiple times before. Right, the boxes are taped up. Now I want you to zoom way out, way out, and think about it from the perspective of the photographer, the artist. What did the photographer have to do to capture this moment? For example, I notice that um, none of these boys are looking at the photographer. So somehow the photographer has snapped this picture without being noticed or without disturbing what's going on. Yes, Amanda has figured out that this is an eclipse that these boys are viewing. And so the photographer is um, able to ignore that and focus in on these boys, right? The picture's in black and white. That is a move. That is an artist's craft move. So I just wanted to just briefly look at this to see how we can think about the photographer as the artist and then translate that to writing. So for example, in the Clint Smith poem, Something You Should Know, we can zoom in and look at specific words, zoom out, look at meaning as a whole, zoom in, look at sentence structure, zoom out, look at mood and tone, and really connect this idea of author's craft with artist's craft. 
So that is me. That is some stuff with the New York Times. Um, I know we're getting kicked out of the room here in just a minute, but hopefully um, you had some fun, saw some resources. And if you have any questions, you can shoot them to me in the chat once we go back to the main room. You can email me. Um, and it was great to have you here. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. We're glad that you're presenting with us. So welcome back, everyone, from your breakout rooms. If you need to turn your camera off, turn off your mic, and step away to refill the coffee or uh, take a break, by all means, do that. Um, I'm here to just welcome you back and make a couple quick announcements and also to hear if anybody would like to take the microphone here in a moment. Um, we'd love to hear what you might try on Monday. What did you hear in your breakout session that was uh, interesting, useful, compelling, um, all those things. As a reminder, all of the breakout room uh, participants, or uh, uh, presenters, pardon me, have that co-hosting ability. I hope they were making recordings um, just due to the limitations of our Zoom account. Um, it's gonna be easier for them to record and then like save and upload. Hopefully they'll, they'll do that and they'll share on our agenda page. I, I put that nice little question mark there. I didn't want to pressure any of them to make sure they had to do the recording, but um, hopefully they will and they'll get that up there in the next day or two. A quick little announcement. Um, a number of us uh, this summer were invited to create a quick reference guide for uh, Norton Education and our uh, publicist and editor at Norton uh, teamed up and they are willing to offer five copies of Teaching English from a Distance. It's a nice little uh, laminated fold flip chart type of uh, resource. And so if you're interested in being put into the door prize drawing, uh, I've put the link on our agenda. I just dropped it in the chat and you're welcome to sign up for that. I know I'm asking you for your address again. I'm sorry, it's just gonna be a little bit easier for me to get that from that form rather than across multiple forms. Uh, thank you for being being willing to, to share your info that way. And then we'll do the drawing at the end of the day today. So um, yeah, oh, Sarah's saying book creator. Looks like it might be fun. Yeah, is there anyone else that would like to take the mic for a moment and uh, just share something that, uh, yeah, I think I can do this on Monday type of uh, activity. Yeah, I'll just say Jeremy opened my eyes to yet another use of Padlet. It just seems so versatile, the different ways we've seen uh, from Jan's use of it that was mentioned earlier. Jeremy's using it for sentence combining. We can just drag parts around. It's so cool. So really enjoyed that, Jeremy. Awesome. Oh, 